In the early 2000s, I heard a reporter talking about a growing trend which they dubbed personally Beckhamism. It was based on Victoria Beckham, who at that time uh, was very well known for her alter ego, Posh Spice of the Spice Girls. Anyway, Beckhamism, said this reporter, was the narcissistic trend of taking what has been provided or presented as an option or a product and tailoring it to suit your desire. So, I will not have the options available to me, rather, I will come up with my own option and then you will serve that to me as and when I want it. Products and services, especially um, menus, were becoming almost superfluous under Beckhamism. As a generation of Beckhamists were demanding that everything be tailored to their taste. All of a sudden, someone had dared to take two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickle, onions on a sesame seed bun, which we know on any day on any planet is a Big Mac from McDonald's, and say, actually, I'll have a Big Mac, no pickles, no cheese, extra lettuce, and uh, oh, make sure you don't add the sauce, put it on the side. I hate when uh, you, you add the sauce too much. The dudes at the counter are like, uh, yeah, um, uh, 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 that's not on the menu, man. Now, that's what he's saying. But what he's thinking is, what planet are you from? Martians from Mars, no. A Big Mac is two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickle, onions on a sesame seed bun. Whatever that thing was you just tried to describe to me is burger blasphemy of the highest order. Everyone knows a Big Mac's a Big Mac, and that's that. If you want something taken off, you do it. We don't. We sell Big Macs. You see all the pickles on the window, the pickles on the ceiling? They're junior burgers. Have you ever met a kid that wants a pickle on a junior burger? No. But did we take them off? No. Because pickles come on junior burgers. You want one or not? That's how it used to be. Have you ever tried to navigate a Macca's menu these days? Especially that computer screen there? It's like... A cyclone has ripped through a Lego store and you've been commissioned to try and reassemble something that's familiar. We've got people having salad instead of French fries. We're swapping fruit cups with hash browns, putting ice cream on top of drinks, removing caffeine and milk from coffee, which let's face it, it's questionable whether we could call it that still, without those components. But if you buy a house, if you buy a car, if you buy a burrito, you're building it according to your desire. You will take the components you want and omit the offense. We won't go back to restaurants that don't allow our substitutions and seek to limit us with their menu. The same principle can be seen, unfortunately, in people's spiritual lives too. I was reading that a popular actor, Goldie Horn, many of you will know, young ones will go, what? She was big in the 80s. She described herself as a Jewish Buddhist. How on earth is anyone a Jewish Buddhist? I mean, who's leading that hybrid religion? Is it a Jewish rabbi or a Buddhist priest who has compromised their spirituality in such a way as to affirm... Goldie's mixed menu of spirituality. You see, people are deeply spiritual today. Like never before, I mentioned last week, have I seen my peers, my generation, that are especially spiritually hungry. But their spirituality doesn't represent or resemble biblical spirituality. And they aren't automatically monogamous to their God or their religion. 
I've been to so many real estate uh, open for inspections. Um, before we had kids, my wife and I would wake up on a sunny Saturday morning, grab a coffee, and for the fun of it, just go around these open homes and dream. I don't think we'd be allowed in with all our kids now, but sometimes you go in and these houses are just beautifully done up. They're all hired furniture, presenting the dream, and, and it looks nice. But sometimes you go and you can tell that this is real stuff, like the owners are presenting nicely, but there's a photo of the family on the wall, there's some artifacts, some school, uh, school representation, and I'd find it so interesting, I'd just look at the decorations and the decor trying to work out what I could about those people. Let that be a lesson to anyone selling a house. Not everyone's there to check your house out, some people are looking at the stuff trying to work you out. So bit creepy, but just saying, you, you open the door. So, But I can't tell you how often I'd go into a house and see Buddha. I mean, Buddha is the MVP of open home inspections, decor. And uh, whether it's a water feature or a statue, whether it's a body or a head, a tapestry, an incense burner, Buddha's everywhere. But you know what? In the same house, you might see a Christian cross. And then you might see like a uniform or some award from a Catholic school. And the family might have a photo of what seems like a christening. And it's kind of like these people have just gone through the cafeteria line, picking and choosing elements of different religions they would like to follow. Or not. And it's not no faith, and it's almost not even a different faith as much as it is a designer faith. You just design whatever you want and believe in it, or not. Faith in Christ is not combined with faith in anything else. To follow Christ, people have to leave everything and everyone. He demands total loyalty and obedience because he is the one true God. It would be unreasonable for him not to. He will not share his glory with anyone else, but he will share his kingdom with all who love him, with their heart and their soul and their mind. Matthew 22. Those people are growing people. That's the first component of our vision for Maroubra Baptist Church, to be growing people. It is discipleship. It is responding to the call of Christ to follow him in word and deed, or we might say in his words and in his ways. We listen to his teaching, we obey it, we follow it, we believe it, but then we actually follow him in his ways and we live in accordance to the way he wants us to live. We see this in the beginning of the Gospels. They are the accounts of Jesus' life and ministry. He goes and finds these guys. He calls disciples. He calls them to follow him. They drop their fishing nets. They drop whatever they're doing and they go. And he says about this relationship in John chapter 10. He says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. You see, to follow Jesus is to have faith in him. It is to love him as saviour, but it is to obey him as Lord. And if we are Christians, it is because Jesus has called us and we've heard his voice. And if we have heard his voice in a saving way, we will follow him. We will love him. We will treasure him. We will worship him. And what does he say in verse 27 of John 10? I know them. I know them. The word know there is gnosko. It means a knowledge grounded on a personal experience. The question we need to answer in our Christian spirituality is... Do we have a knowledge of Jesus, 
does Jesus have a knowledge of us that is grounded in an ongoing personal experience? If we don't answer that question before we die, Jesus will answer that question after we die and it's too late to change the answer. Matthew 7, 22. On that day, many will say to me, that's the judgment day when we stand before Christ. Lord, Lord, didn't we do a whole heap of religious stuff in church? Then I will announce to them, says Jesus, I never knew you, Gnosko. Depart from me. I know who you are, Jesus says. I mean, I created you. I know you better than you know you. And you know who I am, of course. I'm on all your Christmas cards. I'm the butt of some of your jokes. I'm an interchangeable swear word from time to time. But maybe I'm even a fond tradition for your family. But I never knew you in a way that was grounded in a spiritual relationship a personal relationship of you loving me with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. My spirit never dwelt in you. My father and I, we never came to make our home with you because we knocked on the door of your heart and you didn't answer. There's no personal relationship, just play acting in religion. There's no gnosko here. When we follow Jesus as his disciples, we know him and we are known by him. And apart from growing in our love for him and growing in our knowledge of him in his word and growing in our understanding of who we are, that is our identity in Christ as people forgiven, redeemed, accepted and loved, people of purpose and worth, And potential, he says to us, follow me. And now, in fact, I want you to do something really special in the world. I want you to know them like I know you. Think about that. How did Jesus know his disciples? Of course. Donosco, through personal experience, he was humble with them, he was patient with them, sometimes stern, sometimes funny. Loyal, definitely. Sacrificial, a cosmic understatement. But in short, he loved them. Jesus, knowing his disciples, was grounded in the personal experience of loving them. And the essence of his love for them was the love of God. That's why Jesus came, is it not? Jesus came to do the Father's will because he loved the Father with his entire being. And in carrying out the Father's will, he loved us with an indescribable love. Because that is God's will. You can't love God and not love people. So there's no point loving church if you don't love the world. 1 John 4. If anyone says, I love God and yet hates his brother or sister, man, he's a liar. For the person who does not love the brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen doesn't make sense. Knowing people is loving people with the love of Christ. And loving people is the will of God. So when we love people, when we know people in his name, he is glorified by how we love them. And his glory is the purpose of everything. So now we have the second component of our vision statement from Maroubra Baptist Church, knowing people. We are growing people, knowing people. Growing people are disciples of Christ, loving God with all their heart, their soul and their mind. Knowing people 
are loving others with the love of God that, throw, that flows through us as disciples of Christ. Matthew 22, 37 and 39. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is the great command given to Moses in God's law and cited by Jesus. Concerning a new command Jesus gave his disciples the night before his crucifixion, John writes in his gospel where Jesus says, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are to also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is knowing people in loving people, just like Jesus loved us. And verse 35 there, presupposes that we are Jesus' disciples. He said, this is how people will know you're my disciples, right? We're his disciples. That is, you've heard his voice, followed in his words, his ways, thereby loving him with all our heart, soul and mind, and that is growing people. So this new commandment might be understood as a renewed commandment, like an old book in a new edition. Same substance with a new cover, edited and enlarged. Look at 1 John, he writes in his epistle, Now this is his command, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he commanded us. So loving God is loving Jesus Christ, and loving one another is the command he has given us. Let there be no confusion. To love God is not to love some generic energy. It's not to love some mystical mix of conjured spirits that people peddle at will. But it is to love the one and only true God, Jesus Christ. Anything other than that, we're only deceiving ourselves. And he says, there will come a day where I say, mate, I don't know you. We never had a relationship grounded in personal experience where I called you, you dropped everything and followed me and then loved the world like I loved you. You played around in my church when I called you to pour your heart into my world. We don't want that. We're growing people, knowing people. That's God's vision for his church. We find it in the great commandment, Matthew 22. We see it in the new commandment, John 13. And now in the great commission of Matthew 28. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had just directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped. But some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Notice here, there's only 11 disciples one of them, Judas, the one that be betrayed Jesus, despite spending a great deal of time with Jesus, despite close proximity, walking in his proximity, carrying on many acts of charity and what we would probably perceive as a spirituality, Jesus ultimately could say, Judas, I never knew you not in a saving way. There were 11 disciples. Verse 17. They saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. We can draw great encouragement from that verse. Everyone worshipped, 
Some doubted. But only some doubted. But everyone worshipped. Even the ones who doubted, they worshipped. I love how real that verse is. I love that worship of Christ does not say, fake it till you make it so no one notices. They think you're okay. But rather it confesses, oh, I'm weak. I will put my trust in the one who is strong enough to carry my doubt because I have doubt. The one who knows me better than I know myself in a personal relationship that is grounded in an experience of Christ's love and covenant-keeping faithfulness. We don't have it all together and we don't have to. We aren't as strong as we'd like to be always and we don't have to be. We don't have no doubts when we come to Christ and worship, and receive love, and mercy. That Greek word for doubt in verse 17 is distadzo. I know I'm hitting the Greek a bit this morning, but I don't want the meanings to be lost. Distadzo means to hesitate. It means to waver. It's only used one other time in the Bible. Matthew 14. Jesus is walking on water. The disciples are in the boat. Jesus said, come. And climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught hold of him, and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? Why? Distadzo. The point is this. As followers of Christ, there will be times when we hesitate. Distadzo. There will come a time when we start to do miraculous things in response to the call of Christ, like Peter did, and then we start to suddenly think in natural terms instead of supernatural truths. We start to focus on the strength of the wind. We start to look at the size of the waves. And we begin to sink. That's going to happen from time to time. And when it does, we cry out, Lord, save me. And Jesus reaches out and pulls us in. We don't stop worshipping even when life causes us to hesitate, to studs off. In fact, that may be the moment of our truest worship. I began speaking about Beckhamizing the Bible. People picking and choosing parts, tailoring it to them, their desire, discarding the parts they don't like, taking what they can use. I'm not talking about the world doing that. I'm talking about us, the church. The church can't choose to love God and not people. We can't be disciples of Christ and follow him if we're not on mission in the world. I'm not talking about just friends, loving them like Christ loves us. That's easy. I'm talking about strangers. I'm talking about enemies, the misfits, all people. You see, we don't become disciples of Christ on our own terms. Discipleship is a decision to leave our own terms and follow Jesus on his terms. That's growing people, knowing people. When the church does that, lives are changed. Ours first, then the world's. 
indeed eternities are changed. A great example of that kind of change is found in Aussie high jumper Nicola McDermott who won the silver last night. Jumping higher than any Australian woman has ever jumped to win that medal. Between each jump, many of you saw it, she would write in a journal incessantly. It became as entertaining as any jump. What's going on in the journal? Everyone wanted to know. The world was dying to find out. What are you writing in that journal? Turns out she was rating herself with her jumps, encouraging herself. It's part of her process. But listen to what she said in an interview last night. As a teenager, I was always an outcast. And I got welcomed into a faith community that loved me. That's knowing people. I remember encountering God's love and it changed the way I thought of myself as a misfit. That's growing people. It gave me passion and purpose and I think in 2017 it was my big moment when I flicked a switch and I decided to pursue God over sport and whatever comes with sport is a bonus. But I'm already complete and perfect in love regardless of it. That has just allowed me to soar over every high jump bar and not be scared anymore because I am loved. That is the most important thing. That is the most important thing. The love of God and the love of people. A growing people, knowing people. Let's pray.